going to mug me. I'm not going to mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veeley now. Storm clouds gather over the Mediterranean Sea and its dark secrets. Here, along the coasts of Italy, dozens, some say even hundreds of ships carrying a lethal cargo of toxic waste were allegedly sunk during the 1980s and 1990s, while yet more poisonous refuse was dumped in clandestine pits on dry land. The poisoned ships and the secret waste landfills have been the subject of investigation for decades. But institutions in Italy have consistently failed to uncover the true extent of criminal disposal of the unmentionable side effects of Europe's economic boom. Andrea Palladino of Il Fatto Quotidiano, an Italian investigative journalist and researcher, has come to the city of Amantea, Calabria, to visit the site where in 1990 a mysterious ship washed ashore without its crew. The stormy seas on the 14th of December 1990 pushed the roll-on, roll-off cargo ship Rosso onto the beach of Formicike, just south of Amantea. It was on its way from Malta to La Spezia. In this unique footage shot by a local police officer, the ship is still at the mercy of the waves. What was aboard the ship when it was abandoned by the crew may never be known, as a conspiracy of silence surrounds the disposal of toxic waste in Italy in the 1980s and 90s, a conspiracy that has claimed at least two lives. It is a moral crisis that still affects Italy and the Mediterranean today. What is important, also out of respect for a journalist colleague who died following this lead, is to demand the truth always and relentlessly with regards to this traffic. Today, and I have to say this with sadness, we have only repentant informers from within the Camorra. There is not a single industrialist who has admitted to a crime. If these ships, or even just a few of these ships, actually do contain radioactive material, or dangerous toxic materials as they used to call it, they are ticking time bombs. From Calabria to Naples, the story of the illegal disposal of toxic waste is one of the darkest pages in the history of Italian and European industrial development. The small Calabrian town on the Tyrrhenian coastline was the scene of one of the most extraordinary shipwrecks of the time. On the 14th of December 1990, the MV Rosso was on the home leg of a journey from Marina di Carrara to Malta and back to La Spezia, when it ran into trouble and began taking on water. The crew was winched off, but 11 hours later, it was washed up onto the beach here. The ship had a sinister story. At the end of 1989, the Jolly Rosso leaves for Beirut in the Lebanon and was going to pick up dangerous waste, Italian waste, produced by Italian industry, that had been brought there a few months previously, a year and a half previously, illegally, according to the Lebanese government, and left near Beirut, in a suburb of Beirut. The salvage company Smith was called in with a tug to try to pull the Rosso off the shore, but this proved impossible. Over the next year, the ship was broken up on the beach by a local company. What the Rosso was carrying and why the crew abandoned it, although not in danger of sinking, has become part of the wider investigation into the clandestine toxic ships. There is some evidence that the residues from the Rosso, ex Jolly Rosso, 
were found in the area of the River Oliva. Another train station, another mystery. Cape Spartivento is where Andrea Palladino has come to meet an old friend, a veteran of the case of the Mediterranean's toxic ships. The inquiry eventually brought here Nuccio Barilà, today Secretary General of the Lega Ambiente conservationist organization. This is where the Tyrrhenian and Ionian seas meet, where the sea floor is more than a thousand meters deep, a perfect place to hide a toxic ship. The ship's name was Regal, and records show it sank on the 21st of September 1987. A cloak of mystery still surrounds it, despite years of investigations set off by an informer of the Lega Ambiente. In 1994, we came across a story that was strange, weird, unique. And as the National Observatory for Legality and as the Reggio Calabria section of the Lega Ambiente, we presented a complaint to the prefecture of Reggio Calabria, a small prefecture, on the basis of information we had received. The informer told the activists that the local mafia, the Andrangheta, was carrying toxic waste from ships that docked in Calabria to be hidden in the caves of Aspromonte, the wild mountain range of Calabria. The complex and wide-ranging investigation met with institutional hostility and cover-ups. Still today, the rivers and sea in the area present worrying signs of radioactivity. What has been established is that this sea has significant contamination of heavy metals and cesium-187, and this has been established in analysis done by Italian environmental agencies. Far to the north of Italy, journalist Sondra Coggio has battled for decades to shed light on waste trafficking in the La Spezia area, both in the local landfills and in ships sailing from the port. Calabria is perfect because it had a very deep sea floor with undersea canyons and has natural mineralogical characteristics, such that radars will always identify base radioactivity. This has been explained to me by several sources that, without wishing to name them, spoke to me about it. Just 20 minutes by car from La Spezia is the port of Marina di Carrara, specialized in loading marble from the most famous marble quarries in the world. Many of the mystery ships left either La Spezia or this port. Marble dust is heavy and known to mask radioactivity. In quel periodo, per esempio, fu decisivo at that time, for example, the contribution of the forestry police of Brescia was decisive and extremely important. The forestry police of Brescia that was already investigating these ships, and it was thanks to indications by the forestry police of Brescia, that pointed to one of the ships that occupied us most over the years, the Rigel. If the Regal is the earliest documented toxic ship in Calabria, the Rosso raised investigators' suspicions years after it washed up on the Calabrian coast. This incredible footage of the Rosso shows it empty. The remains of a cargo of tobacco is spread around the hold, and much of it has fallen into the sea and washed up on the shoreline. The outside of the ship has been damaged by an attempt by another ship to tow it before it reached the beach. Another fact that has been proven is that a few kilometers away, on the River Oliva, investigators found industrial waste that was stocked. How can I describe it? Not simply abandoned barrels near a river. No, these were stocked in a reinforced concrete sarcophagus. So, with a method that goes beyond the simple illegal waste disposal that, unfortunately, is characteristic of southern Italy. The mystery of the Rosso 
is emblematic of the story of the toxic ships. There is a wide hole cut in its side to provide access to the hold. The hold seems empty, and yet this film in itself holds an enigma. Only an expert could fully understand the mystery of the toxic ships. One of the key players in the investigation was a Coast Guard captain, Natale de Grazia, who brought his technical knowledge of commercial shipping to the table. He was a close personal friend of Nuccio Barilà. I knew Natale de Grazia as a youth in the quarter we lived in, in the playing fields of Gallico Marina. Then I met him again as a young officer of the Coast Guard. He became our reference in the 1980s for the environmental battles we were fighting. Andrea Palladino wrote a book about the global aspects of toxic waste disposal with a colleague, Sandro Mattioli, who lives and works in Berlin. During the research for the book, it quickly revealed that the waste problem was actually not waste being brought to Germany, but rather waste that was being disposed of down to Italy as well as to Africa in the past. So on this theme, my friend and colleague Andrea Palandido and I, we researched for a long time, and this is how the book came about. The economic boom of the 1970s and 80s led to the growth of production of industrial waste in quantities and of types that had never been seen before. In Europe, there are no less than 100 nuclear electricity generating plants. In 1986, the Chernobyl disaster showed the risk the world was running with nuclear energy. Then there are the hospitals, which use hundreds of kilos of toxic X-ray material every year, not to mention chemical and petrochemical plants. Stocking or destroying radioactive waste that takes thousands of years to break down was becoming a nightmare for Europe. In the 1980s, the Nuclear Energy Agency developed a research project on the shores of Lake Maggiore between Italy and Switzerland to test whether heavy torpedoes, free-falling penetrators, could be literally dropped at high speed into the muddy floor of the world's seas, so deep that they would do no harm to anyone. The project was abandoned in 1987, and in 1993 the solution was officially banned by the London Convention. Di questo progetto si impossessò uno this project fell into the hands of a certain Giorgio Comerio, who set up a company, the ODM, Oceanic Disposal Management, and together with others who gravitated in the area of waste disposal, with contacts with foreign states and so forth, took the project forward privately. In May 1995, the forestry police, together with Captain De Grazia and the Carabinieri, searched the home of Giorgio Comerio, the entrepreneur whose plan it was to sink radioactive waste in the seabed. They find several items and some diaries that are among the evidence of the inquiry and in the materials handed over to the Parliamentary Commission. And on the page of the 21st of September 1987, there's a phrase which reads, Lost the ship. Captain de Grazia notes that from his own research that the only ship to sink on that day was the Regal. Personalmente ho partecipato con un gruppo di giovani volonterosi amici, abbiamo deciso di investire tempo e denaro per realizzare un progetto e un'ipotesi di fattibilità ingegneristica. The Regal allegedly sank on the 21st of September 1987, off the coast at Cape Spativento. It was the subject of a court action brought by Britain's insurance brokers Lloyds, who refused to pay compensation because they suspected the ship had been scuttled. At the time, customs officers in La Spezia, the port it had departed from, had suspected the ship owners of smuggling and had tapped their phones. 
le intercettazioni servirono molto perché in codice... Phone taps were useful because they used code words to announce the sinking of the Rigel using code words that became famous. The child is born, he's a boy, this morning at dawn. ...che sono poi rimaste famose, eh, il bimbo è nato e un maschio stamani all'alba. The wiretaps done at the time revealed some dialogue of the crew, at times fairly raw, where they would say, oh, this time the cargo is really shit. Sorry for the term, but they used it to say, this was not your usual cargo. It was a particular cargo. Quando i magistrati di Reggio Calabria hanno ricevuto when the investigators of Reggio Calabria received the information from the Brescia Forestry Police, they found out that the Forestry Police was in touch with a source known as Pinocchio, that the ship was also carrying modified uranium, extremely dangerous radioactive material that alarmed the investigators and that narrowed the investigation. Rappresentavano un punto d'allarme per la magistratura. Da lì partì la focalizzazione di una indagine. Le assicurazioni del, che avevano coperto... The insurance company that had covered the cargo charged a private investigation company specialized in naval insurance to verify what had really happened. One of their sources, from Piraeus in Greece, told them that the ship actually hadn't sunk at Capo Spartivento, that it had continued its journey to the Lebanon, reached a small port north of Beirut and that they could identify the ship and hand it over to the insurance company. New research by Andrea Palladino and a colleague, Andrea Tornago, has shown that it is possible that the Rigo actually completed its journey and the alleged sinking was an elaborate smokescreen so that the waste could not be traced. What they are told is that the ship had been repainted, ready to change IMO number, name, and return to the seas. The 21st of September 1987 is the date of arrival in Beirut of the ship Radost that brought Italian waste to Beirut, the waste that would be retrieved by the Jolly Rosso, which is another story. And there's something else. There's an acronym on the page of that diary, which is the acronym of the company that actually carried out the search for the Rigel. During the same search, the investigators allegedly also found the death certificate of an Italian journalist murdered in Somalia in 1994. Somalia was one of Italy's client states, until the devastating civil war of 1992. Somalia was certainly the arrival point of Italian waste, so much so that one of the first voyages of one of the first toxic ships, the Lynx, which left Marina di Carrara in 1986, headed for Djibouti, which is a French protectorate next to Somalia, which was probably a cover. This is a supposition, but there are certainly no waste treatment plants in Djibouti, that's for sure. The Ilaria Alpi case is one that still torments the Italian judicial scene and has been dogged by cover-ups and judicial errors. These pictures of the journalist and her cameraman, Miran Hrovatin, were taken by photojournalist Raffaele Ciriello, later killed in Palestine. Ilaria Alpi makes her last journey in March 1994 and she leaves for Bozazo. Bozazo is in the north of Somalia, far from the conflict. It wasn't an area of conflict. On the 14th of March, in the afternoon, she arrives in Bozazo port and there's a key interview with the Sultan of Bozazo where there's a suggestion, a suggestion, where it becomes clear that Ilaria Alpi is interested in a Somali shipping company, supported by Italian cooperation money based at that time in Gaeta. The fishing company Shifco, managed by Omar Said Mugne, a Somali who ran the business from Italy, was later identified by the United Nations as covering an arms smuggling operation, as these documents show. The tape brought back from Somalia shows a strange cut during the interview. 
invece non crede che sarebbe importante che si sapesse che, che c'è questa... Ma è tanto... Beh, durante il collasso lui era a capo di questa flotta, una internazionale che si chiama Shifco. Ed era una proprietà praticamente di, di Siadbor. E lui gli faceva il, il, l'amministratore. A few hours later, Ilaria Alpi and her cameraman were shot dead in the streets of Mogadishu. They were violent times, but this seemed more like an execution, said her friends. There's a story tied to several documents attributable to the Italian secret services that indicate that there was a mission underway by our military intelligence, uh, special services essentially, outside the military intelligence, so groups of special intelligence forces I don't know what they are officially called, that was being carried out at that time in Bozazo. Obviously, this suggests a particularly worrying context with regards to the death of Ilaria Alpi. What is certain is that when Ilaria Alpi returns to Mogadishu, uh, together with her cameraman, Miram Hrovatin, she is killed in an ambush, an ambush to all effects. And what is certain, and always happens in these stories, is that the following investigations are dogged by evidence tampering, false leads and epic failures. Another mysterious death blocked the investigation into the toxic ships. On the 12th of December 1995, Captain Natale de Grazia and colleagues were on their way up to La Spezia to collect key evidence that could have proved decisive for the investigation when the Coast Guard officer died of an apparent heart attack. The investigators had been threatened. Some of them followed. Strange things were happening around this investigation, so much so that due to the seriousness of the crimes and the international implications, the magistrates felt obliged to inform the President of the Republic due to the delicate nature of the investigation. They were about to open a complicated can of worms, and De Grazia was a key that opened many doors. That investigation could have turned a corner, and that corner was represented by a ship, and this is a story of ships. And it was the Latvia that had once belonged to the Soviet secret services, the KGB, which at a certain point, and this is 1995, there's a source of the group of investigators that were following the toxic ships that told them the ship was about to leave port and that it was going to be used to carry dangerous cargo, probably radioactive. Natale di Grazia had turned an unwelcome spotlight on the toxic ships that left from the port of La Spezia and the Latvia could have been crucial to the investigation. Later, he was found to have been poisoned. The problem is that this ship leaves about a week before Natale di Grazia's journey, without him knowing it. Official documents say that it was towed by then it was a wreck, it had been burned too, towed to Turkey. I and other colleagues have written to the yards that should have received this ship, but we never received a reply with regards to what happened to this ship, so there is no certainty about what happened to it. It is the epilogue to an investigation that evolved over the 1990s that involves the death of Natale di Grazia. Occupò gli anni, gli anni 90 che si sovrappone appunto alla morte di, di Natale De Grazia. Investigators found that the hub of the traffic was La Spezia and the nearby port of Marina di Carrara. La Spezia is an important naval base and Marina di Carrara serves the most famous marble quarries in the world. Uh, 
a volte ci sono carichi che non hanno senso, ad esempio. Sometimes there are cargoes that have no sense. Often, for example, there is a cargo of marble granules or residue, or cement blocks, which have such a low economic value that it makes no sense to carry them. So, analyzing this data, we find out that there are dozens and dozens of sinkings that are at least suspicious. The case became bogged down until 2005, when there was a new opening into the dark world of the sunken toxic ships of the Mediterranean. Dr. Giordano Bruno of the Paola Prosecutor's Office opened an investigation on the basis of information he received, according to which there is a possible sighting of a wreck a few kilometers out from Amantea, so a place that falls in line with the story, at Cetraro, a cargo, a cargo ship with a significant name, the Kunski, another name that goes back to Beirut in 1989, because the Kunski was used in the operation to recover the industrial waste from Beirut. Francesco Fonti, an ex-member of the Calabrian Mafia, delivered to the Italian magazine Espresso a 49-page document that names the ships containing toxic waste that he personally sank and their locations. A search by the Coast Guard delivered these pictures shown on all national and local TV stations pictures from over 400 meters depth to the investigator's desk. They seemed to confirm the words of the Mafia turncoat. From the first images, the length, the shape and other information seem to correspond to what the Mafia turncoat, or ex-Mafia turncoat, one Francesco Fonti said. That ship, as filmed in this first underwater search, corresponded to the Kunski. These waters off the coast of Calabria are among the most beautiful in the Mediterranean. But, according to the Legambiente, they hide the darkest secrets of the 1980s. Bene, ci fu questo clamor dicendo, ecco, vedete, abbiamo trovato finalmente quello che era sempre mancato in questa storia. So there is this clamor because they had found what has always been missing from this investigation, what is generally called the smoking gun. In other words, the proof that the ships were sunk in the Tyrrhenian Sea with dangerous waste, if not radioactive materials, aboard. A private company was sent to carry out a second survey mission, and when they lower the ROV in October, so just two months after the first find, they discovered that the wreck was an old wreck, sunk during a conflict in the early 20th century, the Catania, completely harmless. Analysis of the seawater here shows traces of radioactivity, so much so that fishing was forbidden for months. But the wreck of the Kunski has never been found. However, Prosecutor Bruno, who preferred not to be interviewed but confirmed his findings, continued to investigate the Rosso case. Investigators eventually traced the waste that had been removed from the hold to the place it had been dumped. This is the mouth of the Oliva River, a river that comes down from the mountains behind me, runs down this valley and comes out at a few meters, a few hundred meters from where the Rosso, the ship Rosso, ran aground. More recently, investigators have found industrial waste, certainly industrial waste, certainly waste that comes from industrial activity that is not to be found within a radius of two to three hundred kilometers. They were found close to an artificial bank of this river inside a structure built along the river. In 2011, a local construction entrepreneur was charged with hiding toxic waste. There was no way of knowing if it came from the Rosso. During the investigation, radioactive isotopes were found to be present, 
and analysis was carried out to establish to what extent this came from natural radioactivity, and partially it was due to natural radioactivity, and to what extent due to fallout from Chernobyl, to identify the origins of this radioactive contamination. The doubt remains that there is indeed radioactive waste buried here. Although the film of the hold of the Rosso shows it empty, the local police officer who made it available later claimed to prosecutors that indeed the waste had been removed and relocated in the bed of the river Oliva. Today, he denies this. The mother of all waste deposits was found far to the north, in the port town of La Spezia. An investigation carried out not by La Spezia, but from outside, by the Asti prosecutor's office, laid bare what everyone already knew. Let's be honest, that here there was an illegal traffic of waste, and waste arrived from outside, not only from the industrialized north of the country, but also from outside the frontiers. In 1995, the Asti prosecutors laid bare this reality and showed that administrators, politicians, professionals and Navy personnel were corrupt. Where the excess from these toxic waste dumps went is still a matter of conjecture. The Rosso investigation was closed in 2009, as were many others that involved waste brokers and traffickers of the 1990s, with no convictions. Out of 2,000 documents that are known to mention the trafficking of toxic waste, only 200 have been released. What is sure is that something changed radically in the 1990s with regard to the transport and stocking of toxic waste which began taking new routes. Over the 1990s, the nature of the traffic changed, with investigations into shipping making sinking toxic ships more and more problematic. So it's as though there's a passing of the baton, a phase in which the waste is taken abroad using ships, and mainly in Africa in the 1980s, in which a number of ships were sunk with this waste, after which, maybe as a result of international reaction that leads to international conventions such as the Baal Convention that outlaws the transport of waste, things change and the same network converts with the disposal and deep burial of waste in the area of Campania. The Mafia turncoat Carmine Schiavone contributed to clearly mapping out the extent of the illegal waste disposal and predicted that in 20 years the inhabitants would all start to suffer from cancer. His deposition in 1997, kept secret till 2013, was a shock to investigators. Italy's National Health Institute confirms that in 2014 there was a 10% higher cancer rate for men and 13% higher for women in the Caserta area, with a 56% higher than average hospitalization of children with cancer. Carmine Schiavone speaks of the excess waste. He says that they sent trucks up from the south to pick up the excess. He said to me that first they filled up the whole of the north, wherever they could, under the public works, under the motorways, in the quarries, in the mountains. Then he said, here we filled everything, after which we began taking it south. He said that his he said the clan had brought the radioactive waste from Germany to Italy, brought it to Campania, to the area around Caserta, where he was from, and it had been dumped there. He said the radioactive waste that came from Germany was in leaden boxes and had the stamp of the eagle on it, and it was mixed with a domestic waste or industrial waste, and then these 15 or 20 meter holes were covered. Here in the hinterland of Naples, the local mafia clan, known as the clan of Casal di Principe, the Casalesi, 
controlled the public works contracts. The heartland of the Casalesi clan is this unassuming town close to Naples and Caserta. The local mafia's main business was construction and management of public works, and they had access to trucks, diggers and land. Maurizio Patriciello, parish priest of Caivano, is the leader of the anti-pollution activists. I met Carmine Schiavone a few years ago, and I asked him this. Now tell us, help us, be on our side. And many of the places he indicated are no longer in the countryside. Now there are buildings on them and whole parks. Gianni Caruso is a local activist and has exposed many of the environmental frauds of the past eight years. This is a landfill that is about 30 years old. There are at least 12 like this in the Vasto area of Giuliano. The Vassallo, Bidonietti, Micillo, all the personalities of the Camorra that are all on trial today. And we are all civil plaintiffs. This was a legal landfill. They emptied toxic waste, such as the waste from Porto Marghera, the Acne of Cengio, and the industrial waste of Indesit and Acme. The extreme poverty in the area meant that the local mafia had access to infinite labour in exchange for the basic material necessities. I have heard with my own ears some of the people say, Father, the Camorra gives us bread. This is horrible, but true. When a family lives in poverty, doesn't have money to pay for electricity, and the Camorra gives you the means to put bread on the table, this is true. Obviously, the price is very high. The family will remain a prisoner for their whole lives and will never be able to say no to the Comorra. However, the traffic did not end with Carmine Schiavone's testimony, and there is evidence that it continues today, with high dioxin levels in the air polluting the agricultural products of the area. Although the mafioso indicated the waste landfills where he and his accomplices buried highly toxic waste, his account is just the tip of an iceberg that is just beginning to emerge now, one that is likely to dominate Italy's landscape for decades. The high incidence of certain cancers prompted Don Maurizio and activists in the area of Giuliano and Caivano to get together to protest. 30 years of cover-ups have left the population helpless and infuriated. This is a Vassallo landfill. This where we are now is a weighing machine where the trucks were weighed and then the trucks were discharged. And there's proof that with 100,000 lira, or 50 of today's euros, trucks could be discharged without any form of checks. So the truck could have anything on board, but with 100,000 lira they could discharge it, and the police had to manage the situation because the trucks were lined up out into the road. Most worrying for the locals is that the site has never been stabilised and made safe, and the toxic liquids at the bottom of the landfill threaten to infiltrate the water table that serves millions of local residents. However, the mafiosi of the 1990s, who used their local power to illegally process dangerous waste, have since been rounded up. The problem, says Giovanni, is that the situation never changes. The biggest problem is that the government, through the states of emergency, has allowed ordinary urban waste to be discharged here on top of the toxic waste buried below. So the harm that the very people who should have been protecting us have actually caused is unimaginable. Smoke and gas continue to rise out of holes in the landfill. Toxic gases. 
And yet, close by, the local government of Giuliano has located a gypsy camp, and the children continue to play, avoid school, and engage in the burning of illegal garbage here. The land in this area is known as La Terra dei Fuochi, the land of fires, where toxic waste material is burned with rubber tires. This is a different form of toxic waste disposal from the deep burial of industrial refuse. Mauro Pagnano is a local activist, reporter and photographer and works with Maurizio Patriciello, parish priest of Caivano, to bring the issue to national and international attention. Why Terra dei Fuochi? It's called the Land of Fires as a reference to the toxic fires, the activity by which the residues of textile, construction and other types of local industry are burned. So there are a number of factories that work illegally, then they have to dispose of waste illegally. Mauro Pagnano and Father Maurizio work together with activists like Gianni to force the authorities to take action. I asked the mothers that I knew who had lost their children, Mauro too, I asked Mauro whom you know, if they were available to be photographed with their child. They said yes, and Mauro is great, and 11 of these mothers were photographed with the photo of their dead child in their arms, sitting on the bed in the child's room. I took their pictures after hearing their story, and the pictures were very simple, with the mother, with the picture of their kid in their hands in the child's bedroom. I didn't know how to use these pictures until Father Maurizio said, why don't we do something important? We printed 150,000 postcards addressed to the Pope and to the President of the Republic. At the time, it was Giorgio Napolitano. And we told people to come and to get them free of charge, put a stamp on them, and the President's palace was flooded with these postcards, and the President called us in, and we went to the Quirinale Palace with 13 mothers who had lost their children. The toxic waste hidden 30 years ago by criminal gangs working for international lobbies is still there. But another pressing problem is the thriving submerged economy of counterfeit clothing and footwear. Quindi la camorra dei casalesi ha fatto, diciamo, alleanza the Comorra of the Casalesi clan has allied with the dishonest industrialists and this has allowed tons of industrial waste from the north of Italy to be offloaded into Campania. Then there are the Campania industries of shoes, bags and textiles, most of which work illegally. And since the product isn't registered by the financial police, so if they work illegally, obviously their waste has to be burnt. Burning rubber tires together with the waste ensures that there is no trace of what was being burned, but sends massive quantities of dioxins into the air. We found dumps with mountains of tires. So it's not a single mechanic who goes out to throw them away and doesn't want to pay the refuse tax. They could be companies who have the job of disposing of them. But I don't know. I don't think they all come from Campania, because it's impossible that they produce all these tyres in this area. Sometimes they are used to make a big fire to delay its being extinguished, and that way hide other substances. Because when they burn textile residues, there are solvents in them and other stuff that risk exploding. The poor quarters of the Naples suburbs are the local mafia recruiting ground. Breaking the bond between crime and poverty is almost impossible, and unemployment is high, says Father Maurizio. 
che nel mio quartiere penso che raggiunga l'80%. In my area, I think it reaches 80%. So sometimes I ironically say, by nature, if a person doesn't eat, he should die within 15 days. If he doesn't die, that means he eats. But if he's unemployed and earns nothing, how can he eat? Ma se disoccupate non guadagna, come fa a mangiare? Big industry and small producers living in the shadows together constitute a massive problem of waste control. Illegal and undeclared production processes make for illegal and undeclarable waste. If you think how many roaming merchants there are in Italy who sell counterfeit goods, you have to think that for every kilo of bag, there is at least half a kilo of waste. And where does all that end up? It's a problem. We all think of tax evasion as a problem, and we try to beat it. But we don't see tax evasion as having an effect on the environment. Giovanni has discovered another country road where the byproducts of illegal clothes manufacturing have been disposed of and asbestos has been dumped. In some places, rubber tires have been placed on top of the waste, ready to burn it, to destroy all trace of where it is from. This practice releases dioxins into the air. It all started here, but this is happening all over Italy and even all over Europe. We have opened the Pandora's box. This is just the beginning of the issue of the toxic landfills in the whole of Europe. Poverty and widespread illegal manufacturing have poisoned the economy and the health of the inhabitants of this area north of Naples. But the problem of disposing of toxic waste has become a Europe-wide phenomenon. The disposal of toxic waste in Italy has enriched the local mafias for at least three decades. Organized crime has been able to offer its services to the producers of toxic waste because it controls the territory. Who made the money? The Camorra. In fact, it operates in construction, earth moving and cement, and in waste. They earn more from waste than from drugs. Also because with drug trafficking, you go to jail. With toxic waste, you get a fine. Whatever kind of refuse you are disposing of, all you risk is a fine. The most delicate part of Andrea Palladino's investigation has concerned the extent to which the states involved knew what was happening. If there are Italian entrepreneurs who were connected to the Swiss, British or Luxembourg financial networks, it would be interesting for the security of the state to know more and for the security of the firms who do their work correctly because this kind of traffic creates unfair trade advantages because it lowers the cost. So, in actual fact, the secret services have probably done too little from what emerges. I refer again to what Carmen Schiavone told me. For example, he trafficked cement. He was in construction. And he maintained that the secret services had him load weapons and toxic waste into the hold of the ships below. And then above were the products that were officially being transported by those ships, in this case, cement. They went to countries where there were rebel guerrillas or organized or corrupt groups or politicians. Unfortunately, where there is poverty and unstable governments, there is a lot of corruption. And disposing of the toxic waste in those countries was paid for with arms. And in exchange, drugs were brought back. Why governments wanted to keep how toxic waste was being disposed of a secret is a question no one seems to be able to answer. However, disposing of the byproducts of nuclear energy production seemed to be a particularly tough remit for the Italian governments of the 1990s. C'è stata un'inchiesta importante della Procura di Matera che riguardava soprattutto un, un impianto, il Trisaglia a Rotondella, vicino appunto Matera. 
There was an important investigation by the Procura of Matera that involved the Rotondella plant near Matera, where the investigating judge, Pace, noted that there was a lot of confusion with the registries. It was a plant that contained radioactive and dangerous waste, and during the investigation there was some reference to bad handling of the materials. Italy's parliament has investigated the mysteries surrounding toxic waste disposal in the 1990s and the results have been shocking. Carmine Schiavone and Francesco Fonti were just two of the witnesses called. The spread of the eco-mafias has been traced and recorded. Now it is time to control them. Europe-wide. The safety testing is often left in the hands of the waste producer, and therefore the controls are not that strict. Certainly the Mafia associations had an important role, and I'm referring especially to the Camorra in Campania. But at the heart of these environmental criminal organizations is the wider economic system that also uses the Mafia to drastically lower the cost of waste removal. If the Camorra is able to manipulate the votes and get a politician elected, now that the sons of Camoristi and Mafiosi go to school and university, the Camorra has its own children elected, so we find them in certain places. However, there is an even more profitable line of trade for organized crime that has access to ships and controls local territory, migrants. Andrea Palladino has also traced where the mother ships that carry migrants from Turkey and Egypt to Europe come from. We have traced back at least 15 cargo ships to the shipyards between August 2014 and January 2015 that were used for the transport of migrants to the Italian coasts. But above all, what struck us when analysing the ship owners was the overlap of trafficking. Among them was a ship that had been stopped by Greek authorities because it was transporting 20,000 Kalashnikovs, probably headed for Syria. The Mediterranean Sea, these limpid waters, are also the site of lethal trafficking of people, arms, drugs and toxic waste traffics covered by a conspiracy of silence. Uncovering the crimes of the past is revealing a deadly threat to future generations. For decades, the nightmare of something lurking under the waves that might be dangerous has been weighing on this coastline and on its people. Illegal waste trafficking in the Mediterranean Sea enriches unscrupulous traders, destroys the environment and gives their clients unfair trade advantages. These merchants of death for at least 30 years have profited from war and famine on Europe's doorstep. When you dig outside the waste pits that are already mapped, the prosecutor's office has found, thanks to the forestry police, other waste pits. All it takes is a little bit of digging and you find barrels. Many barrels, very tall barrels, 200 liters each. The locals would talk of these trucks arriving, also from abroad, trucks with foreign license plates, and they were carrying these barrels. And we know also that there had been some very serious episodes such as this worker named Giuseppe Stretti, who was enveloped as he was working by this toxic cloud, as he was moving the barrels, and he died immediately. He'd been fine beforehand. Governments have failed to adequately protect and control the sea. If trade is the heart and soul of prosperity, illegal trafficking of all kinds 
has undermined the stability of the Mediterranean basin and has poisoned and impoverished its inhabitants.